don't cry. Those words almost automatically come out of our mouths when we see someone who's sad or sorrowing. Little Johnny is riding his scooter down the sidewalk and the wheel hits a crack in the sidewalk. His scooter goes one way, he goes the other way. He falls to the pavement. He's bloodied and bruised. He gets up. He runs into the house crying. Mom takes him in his arms and says, don't cry. Your best friend, boyfriend, has just broken up to, with her. It was unexpected. It took her off guard. And she's telling you her story. And at the end of the story, she breaks down crying. And you feel sorry for her. And you tell her, don't cry. But do those words, don't cry, in and of themselves, do they do anything? Do the words, don't cry, make Johnny's knee better? No. It's going to take a wash rag in warm water, some Neosporin, a Band-Aid, and some time to make his knee better. And those words, don't cry, they're not going to make your best friend feel any better. Maybe her boyfriend getting back with her might if she still wants him. Those two words, don't cry, they remind me of the Pinjiri charms that the women in Africa would, would put around the necks of their little children when they died. When I was a missionary there and a little child died, they would go in and find living things from nature like leaves or bark and, and they would put those in a little cloth pouch and sew it together. Then they'd tie a string around that pouch. They'd go to the witch doctor and have him speak an incantation over that. And then they'd tie that and pinjiri charm around their baby's or little child's neck that had died. Their thinking was, the living things in that charm are going to bring my child back to life. They never did. And in the same way, the, the words don't cry aren't going to just take sadness away, take pain away, let alone bring a dead person back to life. They're nice words from someone showing that you care about somebody, right? But that's really all they are. Nice words from a nice person. And I wonder if the crowd in that funeral procession going out a name, I wonder if that's what they thought too when they heard Jesus' words, don't cry. Nice words from a nice person. That, that widow in Nain, her situation was as desperate as it could be. Just like the, the widow in our Old Testament reading, right? They've already buried their husbands. And now they're going to bury their only son, the only source of livelihood for their future. There was a, a considerable crowd that followed her to share in her sorrow and support her. But think about it. What happened after the funeral's over? After this whole crowd leaves? She's going to have to go back home to an empty and a quiet house. And in biblical times, it wasn't unheard of for widows to actually starve to death. The very next funeral in Nain could have been her own. Don't you think that Jesus' words, don't cry, sounded a little empty in her ears? Nice words from a nice person, but that's all they are. What about you and me? When you hear those words, don't cry from Jesus, do they sound a little empty and hollow? You see, every one of us sitting here, we're going to find ourselves in the same position this widow of Nain found herself. One day we'll find a day that death will take a loved one from us. Maybe you've already experienced that day. If not, you will. And, and sometimes in the midst of our sorrow and grief, the words, don't cry, can sound empty and hollow, even if they're coming from Jesus. We all know the words that are said at a Christian funeral, right? Oh, he's in a better place. She'll be right, raised back to life again, right? You know where they are. And, and maybe those words dry our tears for a little bit, but then in a day or two, 
they're going to come back again. Don't cry. Nice words from a nice person. That's exactly what Satan wants you and me to think about these words of Jesus. Nice intention, Jesus, but they're really not taking away any of my sadness and any of my sorrow. But think of it. If these words of Jesus don't cry, don't bring you and me any comfort, then we're destined to go through life constantly fearing our own deaths and dreading somebody else's death, our loved one's death. And that's the kind of life Satan wants you to live. He wants you to live a life where you have guilt in life and fear in death instead of no guilt in life and no fear in death. Do you want to live that kind of life? That's not really life, is it? Isn't, isn't this statement really true? You're not ready to really live life until you're ready to die. Would you agree with that statement? You're not ready to really live life until you're ready to die. How would you apply that statement to yourself? Are you ready to die so you can really live life? Back to the funeral procession. Jesus, he does something shocking, doesn't he? He touches that, that open coffin where the dead body is, and by doing so, it becomes unclean. Remember, in the Old Testament, if you touched a dead body, you became unclean. Why would Jesus do that? He did it for your benefit and mine. He did it to remind us that he came into this world to take on himself the uncleanness of our sin. Do you remember what Paul said to the Christians gathered in Corinth? He said, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so we might become the righteousness of God. But how does that take away the fear of death? How does Jesus taking on himself all the uncleanness of our sin make Jesus' words don't cry more than just nice words from a nice person? Well, let me ask you another question. What makes death sting? What makes it scary? You hear common answers, well, it's the fear of the unknown. I'm going to miss my loved ones. I'm going to miss life on this earth. And those are common and realistic answers, but let's make this personal. Clear your mind for a second. If you have to close your eyes to do so, do so. You're dying. You have a terminal illness. You're in a hospital room or in a hospice room, and you're breathing your last breath. What thoughts are going to go through your mind? You'll think of the life you lived. You'll think of your loved ones. But won't this thought also go through your mind? Where am I going to be? when I die? What's going to happen to me? And if your conscience happens to be in sleep mode at the time, Satan is going to be sure to wake up your conscience. And thoughts are going to go through your mind about regrets and mistakes from your past. Your biggest and your baddest sins are going to flash before your eyes. All of the should-haves, would-haves, could-haves will go through your mind. And together with those thoughts will come the realization I am unclean. I'm contaminated with sin. And that's what makes death scary. That's what makes death sting. To die in the uncleanness of your sin means you're doomed to be separated from God forever in hell. Wasn't it sin that separated Adam and Eve from God in the Garden of Gethsemane? Right? And sin will separate you and me from God when we die. And that's scary to live forever in a place that has no love and no goodness and only evil and bad. But Jesus willingly took on all the uncleanness of your sin and mine. And in doing so, he became a stinking stench of contamination before God in heaven 
And he became now one that was to be damned with separation and hell for that uncleanness. Now maybe can we understand why in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus cried out in agony? He knew he was bearing all the uncleanness of sin. And he knew what he was going to have to endure. Separation from God in hell. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Think about it. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus cried out. So you and I would never have to cry out as someone who had no hope when we die or our loved ones die. You see, Jesus is alive. The one who took on all the uncleanness of your sin is alive at God's right hand. The one who took on all our uncleanness is living proof that our sins are gone. In fact, Jesus is alive at God's right hand pleading for you and me each day. No, Jesus, that one has no sin. I have washed it all away. Remember in our opening verses when Jesus said, I've come so that you can have life and have it to the full. That's what he meant. Because of what he did, you have life now with the uncleanness of your sin gone. You're not separated from God anymore. You're at one with him. That means your soul is alive. By taking the uncleanness of your sin, Jesus took away the spiritual punishment of your sin, separation from God in hell. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he took away the physical punishment of our sin, physical death. Now Jesus has power over death. He commands death. What he tells death to do happens. So he said, young man, I say to you, get up. And guess what? The dead man got up and began to speak. Shouldn't surprise us, right? And isn't that really living? Being able to go through this life knowing you're good with God. You're okay with God. And even when physical death comes, it won't matter. It's just asleep. It, physical death can't change the spiritual life you have with God. So isn't that statement true? You really... You can't really live unless you're ready to die. And knowing what Jesus has done for you and his words, don't cry, remind us that we're ready to die because he's given us spiritual life that death can't change. Don't cry. Doesn't that make a difference as we go through life? Parents with little kids who believe in Jesus, what a comfort to know that they're good no matter what's going to happen in their life. And parents, isn't that an encouragement to bring your children up in the way of the Lord, to pray with them, have devotions with them, talk about your faith with them, bring them to church and Sunday school, because then they're going to be ready to really live this life because they're ready to die. And when you're old and gone and you're wondering if this world's going to hell in a handbasket and you're not around, you can know they're still good to go, right? And for those of you that have serious health issues or those of us that are getting older, isn't it good to know Jesus' words, don't cry? Because they mean that everything's still going to be okay even when our bodies aren't exactly okay, right? And what motivation for us to talk to those that we know that don't know about Jesus yet? Your family, your friends, those you work with, preschool families that are unchurched. Hey, I know somebody who can say, don't cry. And those words are more than just nice words from a nice person. They're life-giving words from a living person. Don't cry. Doesn't that change everything when we're going through trials and troubles in our lives? They remind us that, that those two will come to an end, and we have something far more to look forward to. Don't cry. When you feel like your, your life is just purposeless and directionless, well, those words give your life complete purpose, meaning, and direction. 
To live is Christ. And to die is gain, right? Did you know that there's a company in California that sells tombstones with scrolling LED messages on them? The idea is that before you die, you can record messages that you want your loved ones to see, and they can go to the cemetery and visit your tombstone and see those messages. Well, for me, that would be pretty depressing. All that would do would be remind me of my, lo my loved ones that's not here anymore. If I were to buy a tombstone like that with scrolling LED messages on it, I'd have only one message scroll across it. The two words of Jesus, don't cry. Because they would remind everybody who saw that message of where I am I. And they would also remind them of why they don't have a reason to be sad either, right? Jesus' words, don't cry, they're more than just nice words from a nice person, right? They're life-giving words from a still-living God. Amen. <laughs>